Welcome back, everybody. We're going to talk here about primary hypertension. This is perhaps the most commonly tested um, disorder that you'll ever run into on any board examination. It is so, so, so common. As a matter of fact, a little less than one in three Americans have hypertension. And usually it's primary hypertension as opposed to secondary hypertension. We'll get into what the differences are uh, as we go forward with this talk. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link below or you can get there by clicking on the I button in the upper right hand corner. We'll take you to a link. I really appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos, and I thank all those of you who have already donated. And definitely subscribe to my channel, and you will get notifications as I put more and more videos up. Okay, so this is just kind of a general overview of what we're going to talk about. Um, so hypertension can be divided into primary and secondary hypertension, with primary making up the vast majority of cases. We're going to talk in this video about primary hypertension, um, and then we will go into secondary hypertension in another video. I kind of broke it up for you, so uh, it's in a little bit uh, smaller pieces, easier to digest. Uh, but I don't want to skimp here because, like I said, it is very commonly tested. You will never practice and not run into hypertension, I suppose, unless you're a radiologist or a pathologist or something. But this is, this is absolutely essential, no pun intended, uh, for any board examination for any of the steps. All right, so primary or idiopathic hypertension is the most common disease in the United States. Like I said, it's about 30% of people have hypertension in one form or another. It is defined as a blood pressure of 130 over 90. Um, so um, the exact definitions are going to vary depending on the source. Uh, however, uh, the American Heart Association does define it as more than 130 over 90. And that can be either a systolic more than 130 or a diastolic more than 90. Now, there are two uh, stages of hypertension, and so you'll want to know uh, what those are. Now, we have to have more than two readings that reflect hypertension. So if you just go into the clinic and you're running, you know, hypertensive, like 143 over 94, let's say, uh, then that is not hypertension by itself. You need to have more than one reading. And we also need to exclude things. Um, so if the patient had caffeine before they came in to the clinic, that is something that we need to know about because that will definitely raise your blood pressure. If they're on something like Ritalin uh, or Dexedrine or something like that, that's another thing. So we have to make sure that we're excluding anything else that may raise your blood pressure. And that's something that we will get into when we talk about secondary hypertension. Now, most cases are idiopathic. They do not owe to a specific cause. And there are many, many, many complications of hypertension. Lifestyle modification is the best initial therapy of choice. However, in many patients, we will start antihypertensive drugs immediately upon diagnosis. However, all patients with diagnosed hypertension will need to undergo lifestyle modifications optimally. Uh, and I just want to point out here, um, in an otherwise healthy patient, don't jump straight to medical treatment. We'll go into uh, when we do that and when we don't. So as you can see here, there are a number of risk factors for hypertension. I want you to really hone in on these modifiable risk factors because on CCS, you may be asked um, for optimal treatment. Uh, you'll, you'll be expected to know that if a patient is a smoker, you need to counsel them on smoking cessation. If they are overweight, you need to counsel them on diet and exercise and so forth. Um, so this is all very important stuff for a patient with hypertension because in many instances, if they lose weight, if they uh, stick to a, a, a low sodium diet, um, if they stop smoking, uh, they may actually be able to reverse their hypertension and they wouldn't need antihypertensive drugs. 
This is the classification of hypertension. I want you to really focus on the difference between stage one and stage two. Stage one is a systolic blood pressure of over 130 or a diastolic blood pressure of over 80. And like I said, this needs to be uh, this needs to be continuous. Um, this needs to uh, you know we're not talking about somebody who you know has a cup of coffee, uh, comes in and you know has a high blood pressure. So you need to take that into consideration. You do not want any other factors to throw uh, your diagnosis to hypertension. And then stage two hypertension is defined as a sustained blood pressure of over 140 systolic or 90 diastolic. These are just uh, some uh, comorbidities and, uh, and sequelae of hypertension. So it raises the risk of stroke, peripheral artery disease, coronary artery disease, and end-stage renal disease. Remember the other big cause of end-stage renal disease? Diabetes. Okay, so... Like I've been saying, USMLE problems on hypertension are very common, and they are usually going to be in the outpatient setting. Um, so that is something that you'll want to be aware of. These patients usually come in for just a general checkup. Um, they get routine labs, uh, maybe for a diabetes check. Maybe you know they're just coming in for uh, medication refills. You take their blood pressure and it's elevated and you need to know what to do. And you need to know, again, that you need to have more than one reading. If the patient does have complaints, if it's neurologic, if it's cardiovascular, you need to consider a hypertensive emergency. Um, these patients are not asymptomatic. We'll talk about hypertensive emergency in a little bit. Now, uh, these are your features, and this is the uh, cutoff point. So usually we use 140 over 90. However, if the patient is diabetic or has renal insufficiency, we use a lower cutoff because these patients are at much, much higher risk for uh, developing renal complications. The treatment is always lifestyle modifications, and you want to recheck them uh, in about a month uh, to see how they're doing. Um, now, that being said, there are instances in which we would start antihypertensives immediately. So these are the lifestyle modifications. We want them to lose weight, get into a normal healthy range, BMI of 18 to 25. Uh, the DASH diet plan, uh, sodium restriction, exercise, and moderation of alcohol consumption. Now, upon diagnosis, there are a number of labs that we need to do. And what we're really looking for here are potential secondary causes and potential comorbidities. And that is going to contribute to whether or not we can make a diagnosis of primary hypertension or if we might need to think of possibly secondary causes. And it also is going to guide our therapy because the drug that we use is going to differ based on the patient's comorbidities. So here's the labs that I always order when I have a new patient with hypertension, and this is why. So you get a BMP. We want to look at the renal function to see if there's any kind of uh, uh, renal failure or uh, renal insufficiency, uh, because that is going to be important, especially if you have a patient who's already got an established diagnosis of diabetes. Uh, CBC, we want to exclude anemia, which can point to a chronic kidney disease or uh, polycythemia, which can point to a pheochromocytoma, which is one of the more, uh, I wouldn't say more common, but uh, one of the more commonly tested causes of, uh, of uh, secondary hypertension. You want to get a UA, again, kind of looking at renal function here. You want to get an EKG to evaluate for left ventricular hypertrophy, a big complication of hypertension, chronic hypertension. Get a fasting glucose level, evaluate them for diabetes, especially if they're overweight. Serum lipid profile to evaluate for dyslipidemia and a TSH to exclude hyperthyroidism. And the importance of each of these labs is going to differ based on the presentation of the patient. We'll get into that more when we talk about secondary hypertension. So when do we start treatment and how do we start treatment? If the patient just has an elevated blood pressure, they're not hypertensive, but they're elevated, uh, then we just do lifestyle modifications and check back in with them in three to six months. If they have stage one hypertension, 
then what we do is we evaluate their risk of coronary vascular disease. Now, on the USMLE, you will not be expected to do that because it is a very uh, intense calculation. You always use a, a computer to figure this out. However, I would know the percent risk. So if they have an ASCVD risk of less than 10%, then you just treat them like elevated blood pressure. Do lifestyle modifications and check back in in three to six months. If they are more than 10% risk, then we will treat them uh, with antihypertensive therapy and check back in in a month, which we always do when we start a new drug. If they have stage 2 hypertension, so they're consistently over 140, over 90 or more, um, then we will, again, start antihypertensive therapy, but in this case, we will often go with two agents of different classes. And most commonly, that's going to be lisinopril hydrochlorothiazide, very common combination regimen for treating hypertension. And by the way, when I say different classes, uh, be sure to remember that all the drugs that interfere with the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, so ACE inhibitors, ARBs, direct renin inhibitors like alaskirin, those are, you can consider those the same class. So you would never, ever, ever use an ACE inhibitor with an angiotensin receptor blocker, for instance. Now, the goal in treating essential hypertension is to decrease the risk of mortality and uh, decrease the risk of cardiovascular morbidities like uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, which can eventually lead to congestive heart failure, as well as renal morbidity, which we've already talked about. The first line of therapy always uh, is going to include one of these drugs, thiazide diuretics, calcium channel blockers, ACE inhibitors, and or angiotensin receptor blockers. So any of those drugs could be the right answer. However, in most patients who don't have comorbidities, and that's not a lot of them actually, thiazide diuretics is probably the best option. So hydrochlorothiazide. Okay, so you should also know how to individualize therapy. So if you have a black patient without diabetes, it's actually believed that the ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers are not quite as uh, efficient for these patients. So we generally will go with thiazide diuretics or calcium channel blockers as the preferred initial therapy in those patients. Uh, diabetic patients with albuminuria, uh, you need to know that these patients will go on a RAS inhibiting agent, so an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker. That's because those are nephroprotective. So um, as you're very much aware, um, we start a lot of patients with kidney disease on one of those drugs. With cardiovascular disease, coronary artery disease, AFib, heart failure, go with a beta blocker. That's generally not a therapy for just isolated hypertension. So this is going to be patients with hypertension and some kind of underlying heart disease. And then we're not gonna talk about OB here, uh, but gestational hypertension, go with labetalol, all right? There are a number of other drugs, alpha-methyldopa, uh, hydralazine that can be safely used in pregnancy, but labetalol is generally preferred. Absolutely do not go with a diuretic in patients with uh, hypertension who are pregnant. And then you want to recheck these patients every month until they reach their target blood pressure, which is usually 140 over 90. However, if they are diabetic or have renal insufficiency, then we set the uh, cutoff a little bit lower. All right, so uh, hypertensive emergency is occasionally tested. This is severely elevated blood pressure that's associated with new or progressive target organ damage. Now, don't be focused on the blood pressure itself. Focus on the sy symptoms, the complications. All right, so these complications are usually neurological, cardiac, or renal. So neurologic complications of a hypertensive emergency, or I should say neurologic symptoms, include headache, seizure, encephalopathy, which can be neuropsychiatric symptoms, or blurry vision. Cardiovascular symptoms include chest pain, dyspnea, and palpations, and renal symptoms slash complications include hematuria and changes in urinary output. 
Um, so this will often be given to you on a vignette, uh, but you have to really keep an eye out for this. Uh, make sure you do your fundoscopic exam, get a good history and physical on these patients, but do not delay therapy uh, if you have significant suspicion for a hypertensive emergency. We pretty much do the same workup for these patients, but again, we don't wait for the labs. If you've got a patient who's got hypertension and a headache, you really need to treat them quickly. Uh, the treatment here is IV. Uh, so if there are no neurologic symptoms, you can go with nitroprusside. If there are neurologic symptoms present, you should probably go with, go with labetalol. Um, however, there is conflicting recommendations here. Do not lower the patient's blood pressure by more than 25% in the first couple hours. Be very, very, very uh, judicious about this. We want to lower the blood pressure, but not too fast. And then on CCS, these patients will be disposed to the ICU with continuous cardiac monitoring. Uh, secondary causes are more common in hypertensive emergency. So think of things like pheochromocytoma. Uh, work these patients up appropriately.